Okay, uh, fantastic. Uh, they have said that I can just, uh, you know, bunch them into, into one group. So these people, no, you're joking. Uh, we've got uh, representatives from the University of Brighton and representatives from the University of Warwick, our hosts. So that, that's really quite cool. Um, and you're going to present on digital tools and technologies and curriculum design. I'm really interested in this. So here we go. Thank you. Pass. And there's another microphone here as well. If you need to pass. Yeah, and share around. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so we're going to present um, some work that we've been doing as part of a um, funded project um, from the Warwick, Inst uh, Warwick International Higher Education Academy, we're here, which is based here at Warwick. Um, but before we start, I'll do some introductions. Um, so I'm Jess Humphreys, and I am the Deputy Director of We're Here. Um, and also an academic developer um, and I am joined the beauty of this project it involves students so um, as part of this um, Ashwarya so hi my name is Ashwarya and I'm doing my master's at Warwick Business School and I'm a project officer as a part of this team thank you hi I'm um, Emily Hayter I'm a learning technologist from the University of Brighton Hello, I'm a senior lecturer from the University of Brighton, and my name is Lucy Chilvers. And we've got um, Matt, you need to be up here yeah. as well, don't you? <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> You're Matt. <laughs> so we have other colleagues who are involved, so Matt, who's hiding. Um, we'll pick on you. Yeah, we will. <laughs> um, and then we've got Peter Fossey as well, who's an academic developer, and um, and Ola, yeah, who's a Savannah, student. who's another student. Yeah, yeah he's he's gone to new places, so and um, we can't be here today, unfortunately. Um, so we'll just give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover today in this quick whistle stop tour. Um, so we're going to be looking at the project itself. Uh, back in October last year we started talking about possibly doing some collaborations part of um, we're here there's a collaborative pot of money so that where institutions can work with Warwick on a project and Lucy and I met with um, Juliet and my man, my boss Aleti um, and we talked about what we could do together and one of their areas of interest is the potential role of technology in um, curriculum design and we'll go on to a bit more background and rationale behind that um, so we'll just give you a quick whistle stop tour around what our aims were what we did the methodology we used where we're at um, and as I say it's a project that involves students and staff so it's been really really helpful to work alongside our students to get their perspectives too as it's evolved Cool. So um, one of our starting points um, was to think about what's already been done in this field. Um, and so JISC, um, I'm sure many of you are either part of JISC or um, spoken to people today. Um, they've produced some really um, important publications in this area of curriculum design and the role of digital technology. So um, there's a report back in 2015, I think, or 2016, that produced this diagram in the middle there that's a helpful summary for the different um, aspects of curriculum design that institutions go through. Um, and it, that was a helpful kind of highlight for some of the different aspects we needed to consider when we were exploring how technology can be involved. Um, and that study um, kind of illuminated, um, which is a really long time ago now, if you think how rapidly uh, digital technology has been evolving. Uh, but even way back then in 2015, um, that report uh, shared from about 12 different universities how technology was enabling the curriculum design process to enable more stakeholders, to enable curriculum to be modelled and communicated in more creative ways. Um, and to kind of reduce the admin processes and, and increase the focus on the design process. Uh, we've drawn on the uh, QAA's Digital Taxonomy uh, for Learning, and there's also another really useful document called Beyond uh, Flexible Learning by, the, uh, by Advanced HE. Um, so that we've, we're using a shared vocabulary because it's all very confusing, isn't it, when we're talking about hybrid, high flex, asynchronous, synchronous. Um, and then a recent uh, report also released by JISC, which is really um, interesting and really recommend you read it if you haven't looked at it already, Approaches to Curriculum and Learning Design Across UK Higher Education. So they did a survey that went out nationally, uh, you may well have completed it, 
and it captures universities' approaches to curriculum and learning design uh, post-COVID. So all the interesting learning that we gained through um, the pandemic, how that is now um, informing how universities approach curriculum design um, and learning design, and also really helpful kind of definitions of what we mean by those two different things. So curriculum design being a more holistic design of a whole program, which can include, you know, a professional body accreditation. It can involve um, the content of lectures, the structure of a course, and then learning design focusing more on students' experience, the learning activities in sessions and the digital tools that students are engaging with. And they produce an, a, another helpful model there that um, unpacks the kind of typical stages to learning design that um, seem to be common practice across universities. So all of this informed how we designed our own um, survey, which we'll tell you about in a moment. Um, I'd also just like to share another really useful resource, um, a Padlet board. I don't know if Danielle Hinton's here, but somewhere probably in the alt community is Danielle Hinton, who produced um, a really useful Padlet board that captures, I think, over 100 different universities, different approaches to curriculum design. Um, the URL for that is embedded in our PowerPoint link, but I'm sure we can share it somehow later. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Okay, so as I said, this is a We're Here funded project um, and our aim was to try and address some of the gaps that were in all of the wealth of uh, research that's out there. So we were looking at exploring what, how people are using technology within um, their curriculum design, how it's been used to create an inclusive and accessible experience um, and how we can then inform future developments that are going on. So we have also been talking to um, Helen Beetham and Sheila McNeil and the amount of work that they're doing at the moment. I know they presented some um, work yesterday. Um, Helen shared the latest developments in that project. But we worked, we saw there were some gaps and we thought, how can we potentially fill that? And it was looking at the role of technology in the actual curriculum design process. I'm going to talk again, but we are going to mix it up. Um, so at Warwick, um, we, we thought well, to start with, let's look at our own institutions and see where we're at and what we're doing and reflect upon our own practice before we go out to the wider world. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the Warwick approach um, for curriculum design, um, we, are, we have been developing a new programme where we offer workshops for course leaders, um, a partnered approach. There's a lot of bespoke work that happens within academic development, working with colleagues in specific departments. Um, and we also have been developing um, a Moodle curriculum development essentials. So there's different options for colleagues to engage with us, depending on the stage they're at. And the workshops, of course, leaders are more of a trainer trainer type approach, giving them resources so they can go back to their departments and work with colleagues in that space, those spaces. Um, so it's been um, it's, it's ever evolving. And um, again, the role that technology has played in there has been um, varied. So that has included things like engaging with the use of Padlet, collaborative boards, Miro, um, the use of the Moodle site um, has enabled us to have that asynchronous engagement when people aren't able to come along. We've also been experimenting um, with ABC during the pandemic online, which has been um, interesting. It has um, lots of opportunities and, and some challenges too. Um, and so the technology has been a really key part of that, of how we communicate, of how we engage um, colleagues th through the process in the classroom and beyond. Um, and I'll just go over to Lucy to talk about the, the work at CoLab. Yes, a whistle stop tour. So at the University of Brighton, we have the CoLab curriculum design process that um, I developed with my colleagues in the learning and teaching hub two years ago. Um, and we we were told to take a light touch approach because everyone's got too much work um, and, you know, it's, and everyone's under a lot of pressure. So what we've got is a planning meeting with the course teams. Um, we set up a Teams area and Padlet board for reflection and preparation. And then we provide two course design workshops. So you can see the sort of stuff we talk about under each one, looking at the course aims, rationale, factors driving change, uh, graduate attributes. We tend to leave teams to it when they're thrashing out their structure and pathway. And then we regroup and um, look at their assessment and feedback strategy and alignment with lots of different university policies and benchmarks. Um, and then we also offer two module design workshops now. One's very much around aims and learning outcomes. And then the other is very much informed by the ABC storyboarding approach to uh, learning activities and technologies. And we deliver that in partnership with the learning technologists. Um, 
and we have an online toolkit as well. Um, and some of the platforms, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, that we found really useful is um, the Teams group to enable collaborative working, you know, asynchronously. Uh, the Padlet board, which also gives students access. Um, well, they can access the Teams area as well, but, you know, it's just another place for, to capture reflections, uh, which we structure using our curriculum design framework. And OneNote, so that's our magic tool. If you don't know OneNote, it's a really helpful online notebook, and that captures all of the notes made in the workshops, and then people can add to them as well. I can hand this over now. Um, yeah, so with the kind of the, the results and the insights from the, the GISC, the many sort of GISC reports, um, we decided to do a GISC kind of online survey and disseminated that through kind of various avenues on uh, through CEDAR and on sort of a national scale. Um, and we kind of wanted to design the survey itself and all of the, the sort of survey questions to really kind of plug some of those gaps um, as we heard about in our research aims. And so some of these things we were looking to um, get kind of more details on were how kind of post pandemic when everything went online, but now we kind of have more of an option of how we kind of decide to deliver. Um, whether what kind of modes of delivery and space were being used in the curriculum design process and then um, primarily kind of what digital um, tools and technologies were um, preferred as choice and, and how they were being used at different stages of the process um, and then looking at kind of. Um, all of the collaborators and key stakeholders, so external sort of PSRBs, as well as kind of uh, marketing communications and um, students and staff. And then we also wanted to get an idea of um, how that kind of fits into uh, time and workload models um, in terms of if there was a formal allocation for curriculum design um, kind of activities and how much that, that time that took in practice. Um, and then finally, we asked questions on um, benefits and sort of opportunities in terms of what kind of tools and technologies um, really come out to play with um, encouraging accessibility and flexible needs. Um, and then also kind of the, the main barriers um, and challenges that um, institutions and staff kind of are facing and what further support, um, including kind of reward and recognition they would really like um, within the curriculum design process. So after designing the questionnaires, these questionnaires were distributed all around the UK via contacts. And we found that uh, 27 people participated in this survey. And these people involved in the survey were mostly module leaders, professional staff, and course leads. And uh, so the first thing that, that's okay. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we wanted to know about is what digital tools are being actually used in the process of curriculum design. So we, we can see from the pie chart that a uh, lot of emphasis is given on tools like animation, community building apps, data analysis, along with the growing popularity of AI or artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT, BARD, and Midjourney, along with this lot of other tools which enhanced communication, collaboration, interactivity, and also presentation tools like uh, PowerPoint, Google Slides, and Prezi were used. Uh, next, uh, we were interested in knowing the mode of delivery or the space that was used by people in the process. Uh, so overall, it was found that there was a very nice blend of online and on-campus delivery modes, while uh, there's a growing realm towards the digital platforms. Uh, so we see that 39% of the respondents said that they usually prefer online mode of delivery, which was followed by 33% on campus. So going deeper into the mode of delivery, we actually identified what is the mode of delivery at different stages of curriculum design. And this by different stages, I mean, uh, stages like planning meetings or uh, going into the uh, specific aspects of the curriculum design and the principles that are going to be embedded into the process or developing the course uh, reflection reviews. So it was found that uh, a lot of uh, respondents said that they preferred a mix of online and offline or on campus in person meetings. But of course, there's a more growing trend towards online uh, mode of deliveries. 
Also, there is a concept of hybrid and high flex as mentioned by Lucy before. So hybrid is basically where uh, staff decides the mode of engagement and high flex is where student decides the mode of engagement, which is not very popular, but we can see that is also a growing trend of hybrid kind of mode of delivery. Moving forward, uh, we studied different stakeholders that were involved in the process and uh, we have also studied like how different stakeholders are involved in different stages of curriculum design. And we can see that um, majorly academic uh, colleagues and uh, professional staffs, which are actually in, which are actually engaged in the quality, quality enhancement are uh, more part of the curriculum design process. Uh, there's also inclusion of students and alumni in the process as well. Yeah, so um, to bring, we kind of, one of our questions was asking kind of what um, what levels of sort of accessibility and, and flexibility modes are you being asked to kind of um, bring forward? Um, and what specific um, kind of uh, functions or sort of functionality of the, the technology is helping you kind of make that happen? Um, and so on the left-hand side, I mean, a lot of these things were to do with, uh, well, now staff work, work remote quite a lot of the times. Um, students have to have part-time jobs because of cost of living. Um, there's kind of all of these different modes of engagement and we're trying to kind of bring everyone together in a collaborative sense. So. Um, the hybrid, uh, kind of the, the need for more hybrid, high flex working spaces was um, one thing that was kind of brought up. Um, but then generally kind of what going down the more kind of collaborative working spaces, which were kind of accessible to both um, external participants, um, because we saw that often PSLBs are involved in the curriculum design or kind of um, employers. Um, and then also just in terms of the functionality, um, being able to work on collaborative documents, doing track changes in virgin history and kind of having um, even security kind of measures like password protected documents, um, being able to have collaborative spaces that really kind of enabled the kind of synchronous and asynchronous working. Um, and then within the survey, there were probably over about 140 different digital tools um, uh, sort of collated. Um, but these were the ones in terms of acts that were really helping to facilitate access um, flexibility needs. So Teams and SharePoint, uh, more visual things like Padlets, um, kind of OneDrive for its shared documents and even uh, Miro for kind of collecting um, sort of engagement. Um, and then this was something that was interesting that came out because we really wanted to understand more about um, workload of curriculum design. Um, and so we asked on the left hand side, um, what, uh, how much time people were allocated to complete curriculum design activities, and then how much time they actually take in practice, which is obviously just an estimation. Um, and it's worth noting that for a lot of people, uh, they didn't have like a formal, um, formal sort of allocation, but these are the ones. And you can see on the left hand side, um, some works were given 80 hours and predicted they worked about 200 go from 40 to 60% of workload. Um, generally, some kind of stayed the same or even did sort of less, but you can see that the expectations of kind of the curriculum design process and how much you're having to kind of overwork. And therefore, this is what we were really seeing about, well, how can technology actually help us kind of bring down these, uh, these numbers? And then, yeah, so we, one of our, our questions, we were really interested to see, um, is anybody using AI in curriculum design already, or how would you in the future? And so we, about nine, about 95% of the respondents said that, yes, they would use AI in curriculum design process. Um, and we asked them, well, how, how would you see yourself doing that? And the word cloud on the left kind of gives a lot of different um, things, whether it's kind of, uh, brainstorming, kind of getting to generate content, even kind of feeding in learning outcomes and, and seeing what you're getting back because uh, generative AI is very sort of good at that kind of thing, even in terms of like image uh, generation. Um, and then some of the AI powered tools from the survey that people are using in curriculum design were generally kind of generative text AI models, um, but also you had uh, more kind of AI image um, generators and also some very subject specific things like math GBT, music LLM. And then um, finally, I said about uh, trying to find out what are the main kind of barriers and, and challenges to being able to kind of implement uh, digital tools and technologies. And so the biggest one was 
limited time, which obviously if you go back to the workload model, um, people just don't have the time to kind of learn the new te technologies and actually integrate them into practice. Um, secondly, license or subscription barriers to preferred digital tools. So, which, you know, really suggests that if your preferred digital tool isn't available in your institution, then you're kind of having to go to the second best or sort of third best in order to, to make it work. Um, and then other general things are kind of technical issues or just overwhelmed from using um, things, the lack of training and support, um, difficulty um, in sort of adapting things to the digital. Um, and then in the other category, um, the most sort of, of the respondents said that general resistance to change. So people not wanting to kind of, or not seeing the benefit in actually uh, doing the technology or kind of integrating more digital tools. Um, so one element as well that we looked at in our survey was around reward and recognition. It was something that came out of the work that had been done previously by Helen Beetham and Sheila and McNeil. Um, and so we wanted to incorporate that and just see if it had moved on. But the challenges remain. And um, I'm sure some of these may well look familiar with regards to time allocation, um, the people wanting to have recognition in promotion or in um, leadership training. Um, the idea as well of payment came up a few times. How do we, if we want students involved, how do we um, pay for their time, whether that be financial incentives or other types of incentives? Um, so these, we have no answers, but these are some of the things that came out in that survey. So we're currently in the, mi the middle of our kind of next stage, which is to build on our survey findings with some interviews. Um, so we've only done two at the moment, um, so it's still emerging, but we're, we're keen to explore how other institutions are using digital technology in their curriculum design, um, you know, and if, if they are using AI in that process as well, because obviously it's a very topical uh, conversation and we're really keen to to learn and see how other people are using you know these tools uh, to be more inclusive and flexible um, in the, what, the way that they're approaching curriculum design so if anyone is interested in speaking to us and sharing what you're doing at your institution uh, we'll hang back here at the end so please do come and say hello and we can get in touch with you afterwards um, and we have a couple of discussion questions. I did see we've got a 10 minute warning. So uh, we we have these questions, but I guess that could kind of merge into some Q&A as well. So our, our questions for you are, can you give us some examples of digital technologies which have enabled your curriculum design process to be more inclusive, flexible and or collaborative and how? And do you use AI tools such as ChatGPT in your curriculum design process? Do you think there's opportunities and challenges for this so those are our questions for you um was there anything else we'd like to say to finish up before we kind of hand over um to I the think floor? It's, it's a project that's ongoing there's a lot of interest it came out of work that had previously been done um but the and the AI thing just happened to get a bit exciting when we started um so that obviously is an element that's come through and the case studies have been interesting because they've taken a quite the two we've done a little bit of a different slant from the survey results there's a little bit of a, a dis disparity between the two findings for them at the moment but yeah we're really keen so if you have anything you want to share I'll, we'll stop talking and, and um, welcome questions or thoughts on any of the questions we pose John, shall I give you this? Or your responses to our. Oh, we've got one over there. Here we go. I'm going to navigate this corridor here. Here you go. Thank you. Um, I'm interested. You ask about examples of digital technologies to enable an inclusive and flexible approach. Um, has anybody talked about or have you thought about asking them about? what accessible and inclusive practices with technology enable more people to take part in the, in the, the process. So enable more staff, students to be able to uh, take part with the technology, because we know all these technologies have, you know, they're not hundred percent accessible in themselves and maybe used and accessible. The, uh, my response to that, I don't know if you can answer that, but um, is to share, in our collab, oh sorry, swing <laughs> away. In our collab workshops, we've got um, students in the workshops, but also some that can't be there, as well as colleagues that can't be there. 
So um, we're finding that Teams and OneNote are really flexible platforms because you've got some people synchronously live contributing. You've got some students who are called in to the, a Teams call and then are contributing. And then we've also got other students who are responding to questions that colleagues have posted on the Teams group or one note board and um, they're kind of responding at different timings and I think that that's a really nice flexible way of in including people um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question <laughs> anyone else um, I think in the survey itself we were trying to find out how technology is being used so that was our steer but through the conversations that we've been having with colleagues that have volunteered and any volunteers here welcome um that, that we've gone uh, dealt we can delve in because we've got more opportunity to and to find out some of those exact examples because there was a lot of feedback in the results where we we're like wish we knew who you were because i want to know what, exactly what you're doing with the ai stuff um so yeah Yeah, well, I guess um, at, obviously the example that we were that we were talking about in our in our session is actually yeah a good exemplifier of that. And perhaps to go into a little bit more depth on the one of the slides that I had on there is sort of the, on the one side you have more specialist e-learning authoring software which requires a license and a certain skill set. So Storyline, for example, which I've, I'm trained to use, and then we have the subject matter experts on the other side who have the, the specialism and the people to refer to. And just the basic stuff of, of an Excel spreadsheet, which lies at the back of all of that, that's held on a Teams, a specific project channel that's monitored by our senior learning technologist. And um, that, yeah, that kind of, I was doing all those illities. I realized like flexibility, authenticity, as I was doing that, went in a roll of about 10 of them. But I think they all do they all do count. And one of the things which I like so much about the project we're working on and the, the kind of workflow we've got set up is that flexibility. And I think, that, yeah and lisa and kate would say and hopefully clarified a little bit that that has helped to contribute to the curriculum design yeah so it's kind of using an e-learning resource as sort of a an axis around which different things can be done um which yeah not meaning to blow our own trumpet but it just helps <laughs> just happens to be an answer to your question That's a nice seamless link between the presentations yeah. <laughs> To have that commonality, isn't it? Yeah. Has anybody got, else got any questions? I was I was going to ask one. I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask you at the end. <laughs> I can go. So, as part of this, have you looked at anything to do with curriculum mapping tools? We oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so there were curriculum mapping tools as examples that people gave. Um, and I think one of the things that we were doing is we we're trying to kind of categorize um, sort of tools and technologies into their, you know, defined things. And we're just finding that there's so much kind of overlap. Um, and so in terms of um, tools that were specific to creating creating the accessible flexibility needs, um, curriculum management tools weren't kind of coming up actively sort of in the survey data results but in the kind of the more open-ended um questions people were really wanting their institutions to either invest in those kind of uh, curriculum mapping tools or provide training into what kind of a more sort of data analysis tools so how can i kind of collate data from nss and internal surveys and all of this in order to kind of help us and so I think that's almost one of the next steps in terms of people kind of want that, but they're not from the survey. They're not wouldn't seem to get a lot of people that are sort of actively either using it or kind of uh, promoting some of the the functionality in terms of the research questions we were asking. Uh, I was thinking more about mapping learning outcomes to sessions and sessional outcomes to yeah. broader learning outcomes and how that then maps to what modes of delivery etc so i should disclaimer that i'm talking from a medical curriculum background which is probably one of the oh, anyone anyone else medical in here <laughs> nursing nursing has some similar issues around mapping and then gmc or nmc mapping so yeah. when you've got professional bodies there's there's those layers as well yeah. and from an ai perspective i know that we've got staff who are using ai to help them to structure learning outcomes so they're actively telling me that that's what they're doing because it's just it's very helpful structuring things and helping if you're using it in a structured way to help to structure big blocks of text and think about how to break it down 
there's um thanks Kath. yeah the um because the survey was really general and we we had so many things we wanted to ask so we couldn't go into the depth um like that with that side of things but with the conversations with the case studies we are getting that picture of how people are engaging and where these tools become relevant um and the ai again it's been really interesting to to see in the results but how people are using it for inspiration for case study uh, work to update um content uh, checking um the outcomes so um yeah there's 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 a lot there's a lot of information that emily's been working through there <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much. It'd be great to show our appreciation. And obviously, we've got a student here, so we've got to show even extra appreciation.